What is remarkable about cinema is the degree to which art and life are linked and merged in images filled with the world and a beauty filled with meaning. As a result there is some point in considering cinema from the angle of its meanings and functions. Obviously, it is only in the writing, we would say mise en scene, of the individual filmmaker that these are worked out clearly and distinctly, considering it in other words in terms of forms and the formal questions they pose rather than in terms of themes, the themes that the works themselves deal with. The darkened film theater is the theater of myths provoked by and provoking those content to be led along by the screen. We are familiar with the phenomena of fascination, transference, ecstasy, the projections of spectators in tune with the projection of the film. The so-called commercial or consumer cinema, whatever its aesthetic merits, it has until now been the most obvious part of cinema, merely responds to these needs and nourishes them. Conditioning to darkness activates to full effect a kind of reflex in the spectator entering a cinema, expectation, desire even, for familiar forms, recognized patterns, the whole homogenized apparatus. First and perhaps most important, there is the sense of leaving the world of everyday life and entering a darkness close to that of the confessional or the bedroom, the shores of the dream world. The dark in the theater invites the spectator to see the film only as an ingenious dream mechanism, sadly and usually of the crudest and emptiest kind, in other words, as a denial of living, a bracketing off of the world, even if the alternative is a world just as crude and futile. And if the cinema amounted to no more than this industry with its simple rules, if there were no great filmmakers and artists to cause trouble, mess up the cards and disturb the whole mutually tranquilizing producer-consumer osmosis game, by rubbing conventions the wrong way, using secondary illusions to frustrate primary ones, the chances are that film would go on reeling in and out inside a closed circuit, forever repeating the same forms. And, since they produce the same effects, the same series would be dulled out again and again, like some old ham still trotting out the business that once made him a star. The prototype for this kind of closed-circuit cinema, where supply and demand seem tailor-made for each other, has for more than 30 years been represented by Hollywood films, both the B-features and the more ambitious films, with the exception of Hawks, Hitchcock, Long, Ford, Fuller, DeMille, Sternberg, Preminger, Ray, etc. In other words, apart from the auteurs, precisely because they sought to opt out of Hollywood, or to subvert it. If you look at things from this point of view it becomes easier to understand that American cinema's nostalgic followers are in the end nostalgic not for the golden age of an art. They are yearning rather for a kind of paradise lost, a prenatal state with a kind of fetal relationship between spectator child and industry mother. What dedicated supporters of the American cinema love and it has never been, the beauties, the bold strokes or the new forms delivered by the free-ranging talents of Hollywood. On the contrary they have, sadly, been in love with the automatic and problem-free satisfaction of their desires, if such unconscious impulses can be called desires. Entering this enema the spectator is at once imprisoned by the dark. It has conditioned him to receive certain impressions and to expect a series of standardized emotions. He has to make a genuine effort to resist and pull back if he is going to appreciate even the most minor film made by an auteur, which by definition does not conform to the vague norms fixed by the tradition of dark cinemas. Conditioning and habit play an important role here. The average spectator, if he has been an average frequenter of dark and cinemas, will, strangely enough, have retained from his half-sleeping state only the element of repetition, sameness and conformity. His cinematic education wipes out the extraordinary and retains only the clichés and conventions which in his eyes pass for normal cinema. He sees anything that contradicts them as unnatural or as failure. It is equally well known that children quickly grasp the most complex and unusual narrative structure and are not disturbed by the wildest ellipses. In other words they show an open-mindedness which is precisely what prolonged experience of the cinema as entertainment closes off forever.